Today's date is November 17th. I am Jose Maria Paul Silvestrini, and I am not related to the interviewee. This interview is being conducted for the World War II Veterans History Project sponsored by the Historical Society of Palm Beach County and Oxbridge Academy of the Palm Beaches. This oral history will be sent for inclusion in the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. Uh, to start us off, would you please spell your name? J. Elgar. Spell it. Uh, spell it. J A Y E L G A R T. I have to warn you, I got a hearing aid on both ears, and they are essentially good for older people speaking to older people, because <laughs> older people know they have to speak slow and distinct. Okay. When I get on the phone and complain to AT&T about something, <laughs> this is off the cuff. Yes. I get people talking from other countries. They speak English well, but with addiction that these hearing aids don't interpret properly. So I'm at a disadvantage when I speak even to young people that just speak so fast that the brain doesn't work with the hearing aid. But when you watch television, what do they call those things? Um, yeah, the, the Close the captioning. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the words. Usually while you're reading one and trying to get it up to your brain, they went past it already. So I always want to preface that if you speak slowly, I'll get you. Okay. I'll make sure to do as such. <laughs> Well, when was your birthday? March 30th, 1922, birth. And what war did you serve in? World War II. What branch of the military were you in? Signal Corps, and it was really a battalion that was created to back up General Patton and the 3rd Army. At the time, we thought we were going to be a regular battalion and eventually operate as such. But in retrospect, we were to be replacements for people that got killed. And sometimes they pulled out people from our battalion to fill jobs that they weren't prepared for, they weren't trained for. And uh, did but you that was the purpose of our battalion from the beginning. They had that as a plan. And we found that out later on. And then how, how did you feel finding out that you were the replacement for the rest of the Army? Well, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, either you volunteered or you were drafted and you accepted it. And of course, you went to war with a different mental attitude than what young people have to go to war now. Because you had Vietnam and you got the present Iraq, you know. Uh, we felt that it was uh, justified to uh, go and fight. Of course, when they take you in at 18 to 20 and you lived at home all the time and you went a couple of years in college and then you went in, you didn't have the mindset of being a warrior, and they had to really train you mentally so that you would adjust to uh, a life of war. It's difficult, because nowadays you volunteer, you're not drafted, and so uh, it's a different attitude. So you were drafted, you did not enlist then? Uh, I had a number, draft number, and I figured, well, I lived at home until I was actually 20. I was a mama's boy, really. Uh, played a lot of baseball, basketball, in the playgrounds all week after school and weekends, and uh, that was the type of life that you led. So you really weren't 
happy going to war, see. But uh, you, you, I joined and the Signal Corps Reserve, and they sent me to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. We lived in New Jersey. No, at that time, we lived in New York. And uh, went to school for a few weeks in Harrisburg, and then they sent us to an airport there, Lancaster Airport, where we studied uh, small radios that they had for the, I think it was the P-38s in, in the Army. But I understand at that time the Air Force, Navy and, uh, and the Air Corps was all under the operation of the Army. And then during the war they broke away. So I learned about radios without any background, and it was tough. Uh, then from there, three months in Lancaster with the radios, they sent us to Philco in Philadelphia, a 10-week course, again, to study the radios, be able to repair a radio, which in 10 weeks, I don't know, but you thought you followed instructions. Then we went back to Harrisburg. And before you know it, they said, go home for a week and report to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, Signal Corps. And that's where that battalion was created. So that was the 3110 battalion. And it took, uh, my memory is not that great at this point, because I didn't take notes. <laughs> uh, I think we were there about a couple of months when they pulled out 3110 and they pulled out some from the battalion. They didn't take everyone. I don't know, maybe it was because I was on a baseball team there at the time and my first lieutenant was the coach of the baseball team. So he pulled out the players and then the, the before that in the basketball. Anyway, I began to be a core for the next, that, that was 3110, they formed 3111. So that took around three months. Then they sent us to camp, what's the one in uh, Missouri? Oh, Crowder. Huh? Crowder. Camp, camp Crowder. Crowder. Yeah. In Joplin. Joplin, Missouri, it's in that area. And there we really went into a basic training again. I guess they felt they didn't need Signal Corps. They trained so many, too many. And we began getting infantry training. You know, they shoot fake bullets and you're <laughs> crawling along on the wire and so forth. And we were there about three months. And then we went back to New Jersey to Fort Dix, that's a reception center. 10 days, pack up, we're leaving in the morning. We got on a train, went to uh, New York Harbor, and there was the Queen Elizabeth. And we boarded the Queen Elizabeth. This was March 29th. And I went to bed that night on the boat, and I said, my God, it's my birthday tomorrow. We set sail. 10,000 soldiers, maybe uh, wax, and we didn't go too much touring the ship. And it took about seven to eight days, and we landed in Scotland. Got off, spent the night with little pup tents that we put up. You always had it in your backpack. And the next day we got on a train and went to some place in England. I had no idea where it was. It was a great big field. And our battalion, we set up our pup tents and we stayed there. Oh, that must be from around April 10th to June 30th, 
Now, June 6th was D-Day. I don't know if you people have the history of that, mm -hmm. where yeah. we started the invasion and we land June 6th. No, no, when I say we, I don't mean me. Uh, the infantry, they landed at Omaha Beach and then June 30th, we got on the same landing crafts. They jumped in the water. They had to. There was no dock. But by June 30th, they had built wooden docks. So you didn't have to jump into the water. And we stayed on the beach for about a day. The next day, we marched around five miles inland, put up our pup tent, and a couple of days later, we marched another 10 miles. And we went according to how fast General Patton's Third Army went. So I can't recall the times, but I know that within about 15, 20 days, we went through Paris. Not through Paris itself. They kept us out of there, went through the outskirts. And we finally ended up in Reims, which is a big city in France. I guess Patton's army got caught and slowed down somewhere because we stayed there around two months. And again, that was not real army life. You were on the, like a camp, a little scouting camp. We took over a school and did very little. I can't recall how I spent the days. I must have been walking around parks there a lot. And then from Reims, we moved up all of a sudden, Namur, Belgium. And we stayed there waiting to see what would happen. Now, this was December 44 already. Now, what happened at that time from history, maybe you read up on it, the Germans made the last effort of a counterattack to Bastogne, right? Mm -hmm. We were about, I, I don't know for sure, but it must have been around 20 miles from Bastogne. And the news came to us, get ready. Now, I had a carbine that I hadn't shot a bullet out of for maybe a year and a half. And they said, here's a, two clips. I think it was around 15 bullets that you put in. And you're going on guard duty, and here's a hand grenade just in case. Well, I didn't mind a hand grenade because when I played baseball as a, a pitcher, so it didn't bother me. But this was really scary. But nothing happened. We were told that if any soldiers come through, you have to stop them, question them, don't take any kind of answer that they give you. You ask them the questions and make up stories because they had stolen American uniforms the Germans. Or if they killed someone, they had the uniforms. So we had heard that they even turned signs around so that we would go the wrong way if we did move. Well, anyway, time passed and uh, bad weather. There was no airplanes in the air until around the 28th of December when we heard planes, like hundreds of them, come. Most of them were from the British that were in Antwerp. And they came to help us with supplies. We, uh, I understand there was very little gasoline to be had. And then finally we got some tanks come through, and that really ended the war for us because from that point on, we went fast into Germany. Uh, my battalion went into 
Mm. Trying to think of the name of the city in Germany. Well, anyway, we took over a big telephone building that the Germans had, and we installed telephones and, uh, in those days, switchboards, not, the, not like today, and stayed there for around two months. The war ended May 8th, and uh, about 30 days later, they shipped us back to Reims. We had enough points to go home, but they felt the infantry really should go home first, even if they have less points. So we had a colonel that pulled a lot of strings, and he got us to go back to Paris, and we took over a school, like you have a school here, and we stayed in Paris for three months, removing American equipment, telephone equipment, from all the offices that they had set up until hmm, I think it must have been around December 1st when we got on the ship. This was an American ship and we went home. That was the end of it. And you said that you had lived in New Jersey and New York. What other areas did you live in? I uh, grew up in Brooklyn, went to school, high school there. Uh, then from Brooklyn I met the young lady here, got married, and uh, business took me to New Jersey. And we lived in New Jersey for 30 years. 27 years? And about 30 years. 30 altogether. years. That's about it. Until then we came to Florida. Came to Florida yeah. 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we have already discussed, you were drafted, but what were you learning in college when you were drafted? What were you studying? My first two years were in accounting, economics. But the, actually the first year is regular curriculum. And then after the second year, you choose your field, so you take cost accounting. But I was there two years, and that, I'll, t I'll tell you one little thing that happened in between. After the two years, and I joined, had a, before I joined the uh, Signal Corps, they had a naval office in Borough Hall, Brooklyn, so me and another student from Long Island University, we went there and we wanted to enlist for the Naval Air Corps because that was coming up. And the guy interviewed and he looked at both of us and he said, well, you got good qualifications, but you're 6'3 and you're 6'4, we can't put you in those little planes. And they knocked us out just because of that. And that, that That's time. when I got real disgusted and the signal corps came along. Well, my mother said, join the reserve, get some time. A lot of mothers were trying to get more time. As each month went by, uh, the war became less dangerous when you went in. Once they had the Africa campaign and it was going good, it wasn't so dangerous being in, even in the infantry. But in the beginning, oh, we weren't uh, adequately, not we, our soldiers weren't adequately trained. They went in and within three months they were shipped. I don't see how you can train them uh, that well. Mm -hmm. And you said that your mother tried to keep you in the States a lot longer. How did she feel about you being in the military? I knew that eventually I was going to get into it. Uh, as I said before, it was a different mental state. The young people knew that 
this was a war forced on us. And so you were actually going to protect your country and the people that you knew. Nowadays, the kind of war that well, we've been fighting is a different war. So uh, young people have different ideas about it, I know that. And did you have any brothers or sisters? My brother was six years younger. So, he just missed it all. Mm -hmm. Lucky for him. <laughs> he would have been a better soldier. Of he's <laughs> You were in the Signal Corps. Besides, you know, setting up communications and all that, what did the Signal Corps do? Well, this was... Remember, we were trained... <laughs> so many young people were trained in the Air Corps type for the radios and so forth. If they needed 2,000 soldiers trained for that, they took 20,000 and trained them. Don't forget, people were drafted, and I think our government, our army government, didn't know what to do with them. You're bringing in 2 million, 3 million. How do, you know, it, it's like bringing in 10,000 extra students in two months in a school. What, how do you place them? And that's what happened. You, we were trained radio. Then when we went to Fort Monmouth, they trained us to climb the poles and install the wire for overhead lines. But when you went overseas, you didn't go on poles. We were stringing wire along the ground and putting the phones. And we didn't do too much of that. We were there essentially as a backup. It had to be done. They were losing lots of soldiers. Uh, a lot of soldiers got sick in the mine and they were replaced. Not too many from our outfit, but uh, occasionally we had 200 in our company. It's, it count 180 and 160. Mm -hmm. And you said that the infantry had arrived to the beach first during D-Day. What were you doing like in the days before D-Day and how did you get across the channel? Were you in like an well, armada? Well, <laughs> they had trouble uh, keeping an eye on the guys. Uh, there was a town nearby and some guys would like to go into the town. But uh, most of the time you took hikes. We were in a big field. They took us out almost every day for a march of five miles. They kept you busy that way, but uh, it was still they sent a lot of little books. What do they call those? Little ones? big books. Little big yeah, books. That's what they call of them. Of the novels. Yeah. And you'd go to the day room that they set up, and you'd get a book and read it. When you went to stand in line for your meals, of course, you know, it was like a buffet type of thing. You stood in line. They fed many, many people. So you'd read the little book until they, you came to a time to get the food. So I, I read a lot of those books. And you spent, that's how you spent your time. It, it wasn't too long, too long, let's see. We got there around April 6th to 10th, somewhere in that area. And we stayed till June. But you had your pup tent, <laughs> and you read, and uh, the, they, they, they let you do what you wanted. They didn't know what to do with you. Uh, were you waiting for, to be deployed um, in the field near Stonehenge? Stonehenge, we didn't, we didn't even call it that. Uh, when you got off that boat, whatever it was, I forget what they called it. It had a ramp and you got off and you stayed on the beach. 
Stonehenge. No, this was in France, uh, well, Normandy. Ahead, Normandy. Ahead Normandy. This, yeah, you were ahead of the story. Omaha Beach. Uh, wait, is that a question again? Yes. Were you waiting in the field near Stonehenge? Uh, maybe two, three days, and you move up five miles. Uh, then another few days, and you move up another five miles. It all depended on the Third Army capturing the Germans and killing the Germans and moving. And as they moved, we moved. We had no contact with them. I never saw the general. <laughs> we, we were always maybe 10, 20 miles away from them. So we weren't in the vicinity of a German shooting at us or us shooting at the German. So besides that one time when you had to be on guard duty, did you ever, were, did you ever experience any fighting? In Not really. No, no. It just was a thought that if our troops didn't put up a battle in Bastogne and lose incredible totals, we would have had to move in. And as I said before, we weren't trained for that. But instinctively, I guess, you would adjust and get into a fighting mood. And uh, where were you during the Battle of the Bulge? Were you nearby? Was your group nearby? It's about 20 miles away from Bastogne. Mm -hmm. I, it, I don't know what, uh, I don't know what city it was there. Bastogne isn't too far away from the German border. So we could have been another 10, 20 miles away from Bastogne. Uh, and you received a Good Conduct Medal. Would you please explain what this is? I guess if you didn't go on sick call, Innumerable times, you were a good soldier. <laughs> so you got the good medal automatically. If you weren't a troublemaker, if you didn't go into towns with, without a pass, or if you stayed out overnight, they took bed check and you weren't there and you came back the next morning, which happened, you know, we were in Paris at the time. And in Reims, uh, it could disappear also. But mo most of the fellows were 19, 20, 21. The only guys that were in trouble were guys that were married, had to go into service, were maybe 30 years old, had a different life than we had. And when they got into Reims, those French ladies in Paris, they were available. And they, they were missing a lot. But as I said, most of the younger kids didn't experience that. The hardship wasn't there. I mean, if you left a wife and a couple of kids and a good job drafted, you can understand uh, you weren't in a mood to be there. And it was tough on people. So you, um, you were saying that most of the people that were in trouble were the married couple. Were you No, no, no. Don't, don't come to a conclusion that you're married. <laughs> no. Well, not necessarily, but no. usually. Uh, they missed home life. They missed companionship. Uh, we didn't. Mm -hmm. So it's you, just like you're, you're a high school senior. You can do without girls. But if you're married 15 years and they take you from at the age of 35 
come out of the 20, and you're in a different area. It, it was tough. We couldn't understand why these guys maybe fooled around, but I understand now. It was tough. So you were unmarried when you were deployed? When did you meet your lovely wife? Later. 1948? Yes. 1948, we got married in 1949. Yes. Uh, Ellen was five years younger than me, and uh, when I was, let's say, 18, she lived a block away, and I never noticed her. She was 13. I was 18. I'm not going to look at it 13. <laughs> but then when I came back, uh, we, we used, to, to, we used to go to a Jewish center for, on Sundays for dancing and so forth, socials. And uh, I noticed her. One day I said, uh, where do you live? Well, she lives a block away. And so I drove her home. Not my car. My dad had an old, old car. And uh, we had dinner together in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I think something no. clicked. <laughs> <laughs> and then we went for, on a boat ride, not really south. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how it happened. And backtracking a little bit, you said that you were always behind the Third Army. Did you ever meet any of the commanders of that army? No. no. Did you ever meet Dwight Eisenhower? Uh, what about some friendships that you made in the service? Did you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Some friends that you made in the service. Friends? I made about three or four friends. And after the war, we socialized. And uh, when we got married, we socialized with them because they got married. You got to remember, when we came back, we f felt we lost three, four years. And so things happened fast. You found a wife, got a child, and uh, your social life, you see, you started. It was, it was very, it was a very quick change. I imagine uh, it wouldn't have happened without the war. It might have taken a longer time to get settled into a life like that. And the economy was a lot better. Uh, the government treated us very nicely. Of course, when I had two years of college, I went back to college and they supported me. Uh, they paid the tuition for two years. And I don't recall, but Eleanor says that she remembers me telling her I got $50 a month to subsidize me for going to college. So that, that was a good uh, era. I don't, I don't think we're going to treat our servicemen that well now. Certainly not. It's a different, different economy. And it was after two years more of college, you went out to get a job immediately. You looked in a newspaper, went for an interview, you got the job. There were jobs. So this technology revolution, I call it a revolution, is making it much more difficult for you young people eventually to just move in. Remember, your first job paid you about $20, $25 a week. So you could be hired. A guy would, running a business would hire people left and right. But nowadays, I don't know what you stole with. 30,000? So there's a difference. It's a different economy altogether. We had it easy when we came back. And how, how did you come back? I, I know that you said that you were in Paris for a couple of months, but like, how did you come back? What do, you, what do you mean? Like, did you come back by boat? Were oh, you... yeah. Uh, let me see. Where did we leave from? We left from southern France on a, an Ameri the biggest American ship at the time, 
Constitution. Do you remember? The Constitution. Constitution. I broke her in in all this information, <laughs> not for this lesson, but history, uh, which carried about 3,000 soldiers and took five days, that's all. And as we were coming back from France to New York Harbor, no, Boston, Boston Harbor, we would see small boats. They were small boats bringing other soldiers back home. And they took 30 days from Europe to get to the East Coast. And we did it in about five, six days oh with my. that ship. Lucky you to get on that ship. Uh, where were you when you heard that FDR had died? And what was your reaction? Oh, that's a, that's a long time ago. Well, like any person that's known very well in this country, you read about it and you miss them. Nothing more than that. Uh, no, no more than if uh, I know a congressman and he dies. Mm -hmm. Maybe hit by history you should feel bad about it. But that's what life is all about. And where were you when you the Germans had surrendered? I'm not sure if we had that was discussed this. May 8th. We were in Germany already. We, we were in uh, Fulda, 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 hey, Fulda, Germany, that's where we were, we took over a, a small schoolhouse, that's where we slept, we felt bad about it, it wasn't really a schoolhouse, like a boarding school for a school, that's one thing that our colonel did was go out and find a place for us to stay. So we really didn't suffer. We didn't sleep on the ground. One, once we got into Germany, he chased out people from where they lived, the Germans, and we took over. So it was like I had my own room. That's nice. It wasn't a bad life. I'm sure it wasn't. And how, where were you when you first heard about Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Where were you when you first heard about Hiroshima? When I first heard Hiroshima. about Hiroshima. Hiroshima, the atom bomb. Oh, okay. Remember, we got back to Paris, and we were interviewed, and they wanted us to stay in service. And so they said, we'll send you to officer training. I was a corporal at the time. We'll send you to officer training. And we said, well, why, why is that? Well, you get off the training and you go to Pacific. I think we got one guy out of our 200 that stayed and took that. Uh, so, uh, no, we were anxious to uh, go home. And that, let's see, from May 8th, that, that was August, I think, wasn't it? Yes, yes. August. August. So we were in Paris all that time till December, yeah, in December, that's when we went home. Mm -hmm. And how did you adjust to civilian life? Very easily. Uh, my folks had a small grocery store, which isn't around for you people to see anymore. In those days, you had a lot of small businesses, and these people that ran small businesses became middle class. The only big stores we had was someone called A&P. Now you have Publix. Uh, it, it was a different lifestyle. Not too many people in 1946 had cars. Uh, 
uh, you didn't have the luxuries. Uh, if you had a television set, just about be it began. So it was good life. Now, the question again? Oh, uh, how did you adjust to civilian life? Okay. Well, I went back to school, finished school, uh, met Eleanor, got married, worked in the accounting field for about a year. I decided that it really wasn't for me working for a big corporation. So I worked for a small outfit, a furniture outfit, and stayed there till 1956. And then uh, that furniture outfit had 13 stores. They decided they were going to break it up. The owners moved to Florida, mm -hmm. bought a lot of real estate with the money they made, got wealthy. One of, my, one, of, one of my bosses that I was working for there called me and said, there are two stores available. If you want to buy it, we'll buy it. I said, okay. So I bought two little furniture stores. In those days, you could have a little furniture store. And that was 1956. And I had the furniture store until 1979. That was the career. I worked awfully hard. In those days, you worked six days, and stores were open Sunday, so it was six and a half days. And I decided I saved up enough money, was making little investments at the time. We had enough for me to retire. So I went to work for Macy's full time. <laughs> Remember, I was working six and a half days. You go work 40 hours, it's a vacation, <laughs> really. So we stayed there 13 years, and then I retired. Really retired? I, it was time. I was 72. Yeah. And how do you think your experiences in the military have altered your life? I was sympathetic to the young people each time. Korea, I said, what are we doing there? I, I, mentally, I took a tough stand against war. You know, a lot of people felt, uh, why are we there? And then with Vietnam, that was... So that, that's the attitude I had. We really don't belong there. And what life lessons did you learn, you know, while you were there? Life lesson. Yeah. Well, we had two children, two boys, and we enjoyed grow them growing up with us. Unfortunately, one is in Minneapolis and one is in New Jersey now, so. You don't see them that often. But retirees, if they plan their life properly, which is hard to do now with all these extra items and things that you can buy and that you consider that you need them, uh, all my friends retired from some 65, some 70, lead a good life without the financial problems that people are having now. And what was the, on a lighter note, what was the funniest thing to happen to you in the, your time in the military? Not too many funny things. I, I can't... Uh, Not everyone that you lived with was a good neighbor. Remember, you had quite a mix, and not everyone got along. I remember early on, I went 
uh, to take a shower in the morning when you, you got up real early, uh, 5.30, 6, and you ran to take a shower early. I left my wallet on my bed. I came back. I saw the wallet. And I looked in it. Money's missing. And I looked around and I said, boy, you guys are not a team player, I'll tell you that. I never lost another cent that way. And is there anything you'd like people to know about this period of history? The period of World War II? Well, it's something everyone should know about. It was created a lot of tragedy. We lost a lot of people. I guess it, in every war, uh, this is what happens. But we have to make accommodations or changes. These people that are coming back, if they need schooling, we got to support them regardless of, of the cost. I know a lot of people don't agree with that, but if you see what they gave up, we should pay for it. Mm -hmm. So do you think we should be doing more to help our current military? Yep. Yep. And I don't think we should have that much military in reserve because that creates what I feel sometimes our leaders get greedy and do things they shouldn't do. But I don't want to get into the politics of that. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Huh? Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, you're an excellent audience. I don't see anyone sleeping. <laughs> well, I think now it's about time for us to open it up. Oh, so, Mr. Uh, Tony, you've always got a question or two. How did you communicate with friends and family back in the United States when you were in Europe? Uh, there was mail. A lot of mail. Uh, you just wrote a postcard and you brought it to the orderly room, threw it in a box, and you knew that they got the mail. And occasionally, a package would come to you from one of your parents. And I was surprised, because I once got a package and inside was a salami. <laughs> I don't know how it got out. <laughs> it was all what do you call it, colored? Moldy. Moldy. And uh, I had an Italian friend, a close friend developed, and I showed it to him. I said, I'm throwing this away. You don't eat this. He said, what, are you crazy? Of course you eat this. It's excellent. That's what you're supposed to do with salami. I said, here. <laughs> Yeah, no, we, we, we visited him once. He lived in New Jersey down the shore. Nice, nice young man. Um, what was the food and mess facilities like for you when you were in the military? I don't think we ever got real hungry. Uh, there always was K rations. If you I know once, uh, in order to get supplies, you know, they had these packages that we were supposed to get every week for seven days, like a K ration. In it was Hershey bar and a little tin of uh, cheese or some other ham. And uh, I was asked, you want to go pick it up. So we were in Belgium at the time, 
And I said, yeah, how far away? Oh, you've got to go to Liège to get it. I said, what? Well, I don't know, I forget how many miles it was, but it took me around three hours to get there. They gave me a, a van, and I went to pick it up. So that's how you picked up supplies. Uh, and you say that you had K rations. Were there other types of rations that different soldiers would get? A K ration was in a, a package uh, that the soldiers were given if they weren't able to communicate or get back. So you got two of them, three of them, you could get four of them or something if you're going to be away for a day and a half, two days. In the field, that's what they got. Uh, no, we were well fed. We, we had, uh, in our company, we had three, two cooks and a, a staff sergeant in charge of the food to and the whole, the whole battalion, 600 were fed at one time. Every camp got adequate food, especially uh, in cities in New Jersey and uh, Camp Crowder. If you were lucky not to get shipped overseas and get killed, it was a great experience for a young person. I hate to say this, but uh, I was on vacation in New Jersey, really. At Fort Monmouth, I was on a basketball team. Uh, Camp Wood, baseball season, I made the baseball team. I hope you're not getting jealous. <laughs> Just a little bit. And, and the, food, the food was good. Lots of milk, lots of bread, lots of eggs. Hey, people gained weight be being in service. They went in weighing 130 and came out 180. That was, that was one war where the whole populace was involved. What do you remember about scrap drives and rationing? Scrap drives? And scrap drives. And, and rationing. rationing. That was one my department. It was rationing. You want to know something? When you're in a camp, you're away from civilization. Uh, the only time I got a two-day pass, and I, I didn't go home. I, I just made phone calls. So it, you, lo you lost the complete relationship with, with your brother or parents. You got on the phone whenever you could. When you were in England, how well did you get along with the English? Were they very friendly with you? Um, I, wa I wasn't in England uh, as such. We were out in a field I don't think we saw the English people. And when we were out there, we knew we were just waiting to go somewhere. You couldn't uh, get on a bus or a trolley and go into town. We didn't go anywhere from April, April around 6th to June 6th, June 30th, actually. I went nowhere. And it was rugged living. Our bathroom was a long trench in the ground, maybe four feet deep. And usually you went real at night, dark. Of course, you straddled. <laughs> it, was, it was awkward. But that was the facility. Did you ever fall into one? No way. No way. You learn how to live that way. When you were in, 
when you finally hit mainland Europe uh, through your travels through France, Belgium, and Germany, did you ever encounter any German prisoners of war? Yes. Uh, one incident when we were in Reims, we had we took over a schoolhouse, and they had a gym, and my first lieutenant was assigned to make sure that we all kept busy. We try to keep busy with athletics in a gym. And the floor was pretty bad. So he found out that there was a German prisoner of war camp nearby. And he went there and got two carpenters, two Germans that were carpenters by profession. And I don't know, they found some panels and those guys fixed that gym floor. So you couldn't speak to them, you know, but we knew they were there working. And then we'd see as we'd go on hikes, uh, German prisoners with the military soldiers, you know, they would bring him back to the rear. But you never spoke to him. Uh, your commander seems like a rather nice guy. Can you tell us some of your experiences Our, with him? The first lieutenant, he, he was real good. If you had a problem, you felt you can talk to him. And he wasn't experienced, you know. Uh, he probably went to college, was in that program. They still... ROTC. Uh, R -O -T -C. I don't know if they still have that now. Do mm -hmm. Yes, they do. Yeah. Reserve Officer Training Club. So, four years college, if you're in the ROTC uh, and you enlist, you're a second lieutenant. And by the time we went overseas, he became a first lieutenant. And then he had two second lieutenants under him. So, it, it was good. Never had trouble with them. You didn't provide trouble, so they appreciated it. Jay, I notice on your um, your discharge papers it says your name is actually Isidore. <laughs> yeah. And you go by when that. I was when I was in college, I went out to find temporary job, and I didn't get temporary jobs too well. So I contacted um, a neighbor, and he said, you know, you're filling out Isidore. You're going to non-Jewish corporations. Change your name. So I changed it later on. So anti-Semitism. Yes. No, there's no question about it. No question about it. The only good thing that I came across, I said my parents had a grocery store. We lived in an area, upper middle class, and uh, there was one black neighbor who was very successful who used to come into the store. And my mother told him that I can't find a, a part-time job. He said, all right, come, I'll, I'll interview him. So I went. His office was on 125th Street, Manhattan, Harlem. Harlem, yeah. So I went there, and I'm walking along 125th Street. And he interviews me, and he says, you know, how can I hire you when I have so many black fellas coming in trying to work in this area. I said, I understand. I'm sorry. My mother pushed you into this. And I appreciate it. And I left. I felt good that, you know, good relationship there. But I had, I had some bad relationships that way. It's changed. It's different now. But it existed then. Did you see any anti-Semitism in the, in the Army? No. No. 
when you got to Germany, you were fighting against probably one of history's greatest anti-Semites ever. Did that weigh in your thinking about your mission? When we, when we were in Fulda, Germany, that was after May 8th, you know, after German capitulated. We didn't even hear of the camps, of the mass murders. The Stars and Stripes newspaper, Army, I don't know, I forget how often it was printed, never printed it. We didn't know about it. Of course, if I knew about it, I would have uh, tried to get a few days off and go search. It, they kept it from us. It's only when I got home that I heard about it. Interesting. Strange. Yeah. Jay, early on you talked about two things that I wonder if our, our kids understand. Well, one, you talked about the radios in P-38s. Would you tell them what a P-38 is? That was a plane that they originated uh, to fight the type of war at that time. Very, very maneuverable, fast. They had to come up with something to counteract those German planes. That's about and you talk about WAX. <laughs> okay. Uh, WAC, and that's spelled W A C for those of you who are Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Uh, hmm, you know, now that I think of it, they weren't, when we were in Fort Dix, they must have been hidden away in another part of the camp. <laughs> they kept you guys away from the girls, huh? And what is a whack? A whack was a woman and Listy enlisted. I don't think they, they were uh, drafted. They enlisted. A lot of them enlisted to take clerical parts, clerical jobs in the service. Uh, I, I didn't see them other than when you were in a big city like Reims, Paris, then you saw a lot of whites. You, did, you didn't see them in the smaller places. It was the Women's Army Corps. That's what the wax stands for. That was yeah. the wax stands for. Yeah. 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 Uh, you didn't see them. They had, what do they, what they call it? The, the, where they used to entertain the soldiers. In USO. The, USO. They started USOs in the big cities. And you'd go. But you didn't see the wax there. Uh, they had the young French and uh, Belgian girls come to the dances. And I guess there was certain rules that they were told. Because I went to those dances and no girl ever said, would you like to come home? <laughs> Didn't matter. Darn. <laughs> well, good for Eleanor, right? Right, right. <laughs> hey, uh, Nick, Trey, anybody? Brandon, our visitor? Okay, everyone's all good? I have one, one other question. Tony, go right ahead. The military was segregated. Did you ever serve alongside uh, black troops? Did you ever see any? Never occurred to me. But it, it, it existed. I don't remember a Japanese or a Chinese. No. I'm sure at that time, uh, in the Signal Corps, you had a Jewish population, mostly from New York City. And you went to Camp Wood, that was the training place for Signal Corps. We mixed with, the first time I ever met guys from North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, they didn't mix with us. And we didn't mix with them. 
but there was no trouble. Interesting. Jay, Eleanor, this has been an hour and 20 minutes of pure bliss for me. Really? Uh, yeah. Wow. And uh, it was absolutely great. What we usually do at this point is get everyone together and take a picture. And is that okay with you guys? Get you in the middle and everybody up. Let's do it. Let's uh, let's pull this table back just a little bit here. Can you kill the camera? Yep.